you have taken the art form of the banjo beyond anybody that beyond anything that anyone's ever done really what what keeps you motivated to keep experimenting the way that you do and going beyond the the limits so to speak i just uh I'm, I think I'm very self-critical. I get very tired of what I'm playing. Uh -huh. So after a certain period of time of playing a certain repertoire of licks and phrases, I just get disgusted <laughs> and I start not playing them anymore. And so pretty soon I'm playing some different stuff. And I think that sort of short attention span has kept my playing changing. I don't know always for the better, but at least it's always changing. <laughs> and you you're know. keeping yourself interested in what keeping you're doing. Keeping myself interested because I play a lot right. and I do a lot of gigs and, and um, a good amount of recording, although less lately. More, more, more lately I'll take a project and really work on it for a while why instead so? of doing a whole lot of records. Why, why this change now? That, that um, I, think, I think there's a feeling of being rushed through things that I get kind of tired of. Uh -huh. Too. I mean, I don't mind, you know, occasionally you get, get a call to do, do something that's a spontaneous kind of a session where it's a bunch of people are thrown together and whatever happens is cool, and I love that too. But um, when it's my own music, I mean, I, I guess I really want to take the pains to make it really right. Can it, be, can it be a detriment to spend too much time on something? Absolutely. And I'm probably not the best judge of it either. <laughs> but that doesn't stop me from, you know, when it's, when it's up to me doing it doing it that way, right, right. which means taking the time to write the music, not rushing through the writing process, but taking the time to make sure the band is familiar with it. And probably the most improvised part of the project is the actual recording. Then you let it all happen, right? whatever. And you, but you have to be critical. Everything is in okay. And you have to listen back. And you go, okay, well, this is cool, but this isn't really working. And then you work, and then right, right then you just have to work it out and get it. Right. Right. But then after that's done, I like to listen to everything we recorded and pick the best parts and, and you know, get the sounds on all the instruments really good and balanced and, you know, so it's, um... There, there is a looseness there then when you're recording. You don't yeah. stick to like a, pre, like a plan that you have, you know, since you've spent so much time preparing, you don't go in there. No, because I mean, a lot of times the pre preparation, even by the, t by the time we've, we're prepared, we've, it's time to record, we're not that pre as prepared as we should right. because the music's difficult. Mm -hmm. And really, you could spend a week working on a phrase, you know, but instead you've got, in this case, we had a couple of months of touring. We were doing our tour and, um, and learning the songs at sound checks and starting to incorporate them into the show so that by the time we were recording, we had played them all. But they were, you know, we would go in and, uh, and change the arrangements when we record and say, well, live, what did you think? Well, the song worked, but this part was too long, and, right. and okay, we've got enough sax solos, or we haven't featured this instrument in this way yet. Let's make sure, well, let's do it on this song. And then we'd record it, and then we'd record the song for a few, a couple of hours, and just tape all of it. Right. And, um, and not overdub or fix anything, just record everything, and then, uh, and then make a, com a composite of the best parts of those takes kind of like a movie. Right, right. You know, you, you, you shoot all these takes and then you, you, you cut the best version of each section together. Are you ever in the, in the post-production process and realize, like, this is not working, we need to go back and start over? Um, Does that ever happen? No, but sometimes something doesn't sound uh, complete. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, like, sometimes if I think, I mean, I'm generally way critical. So <laughs> if, I, if I think it's, it's okay, it's probably really okay, but um, sometimes for me it's still not like some part of the rhythm section isn't solid enough or something mm -hmm. and and then but but then in the process of, of um, like for instance on this out new album we had a lot of guests by the time a lot of different people played over it if there was a place I wasn't happy as happy I might get somebody who played something sustaining over that section or something distracting you know something right. would have we would do something to solve it and by the end a lot of tunes that I thought were weak after the basic tracks ended up being the strongest songs. So you just never know. You, you, it's not done until it's done. Right, right. And when, when it's done, you know, it sounds good. And so. you, know, you, 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 you know it just by the sound of it You're, when you went to walk away. Yeah, and then we record too many songs. Right. <laughs> so uh, so some, some songs you could say they didn't work out or you could say we picked, the, we, there's four that didn't make the record. Well, mm -hmm. they couldn't have, wouldn't have fit anyway. Something right. would have had to go. So those were the ones that I, I probably or the group thought weren't the most completed or the most, you know, uh, realized sound. Do those tracks have a chance of hanging around and appearing in, at a, in a later release? Um, I, that's a philosophy question because, mm -hmm. like, for, for me, I always feel like you should start fresh each mm -hmm. session with new stuff. And for whatever reason, you didn't choose to use songs on on 
on a record right. probably means they're not they didn't make the cut but the band doesn't always feel that way a lot of times they feel like the right. stuff that gets left could be the best stuff mm -hmm. so luckily there are op opportunities for those tracks you know as time goes on right. and everybody saw that when we released our um, best of album on Warner Brothers we were able to pull two songs from an earlier uh, album that never got released and complete them and solve oh, the problems good. that kept them from being you know the best stuff on the record and make them really good and put them out so so that's a good thing um another element of your music is that you've always been you always blur the lines between genres never never really you know you do you do you have your own unique sound have you ever received criticism from purists that of one form or another that think you shouldn't be doing this kind of thing um yes and no N not directly because i think people that really like pure forms of music aren't necessarily going to come see us and if they do they know that that's not what they're there for like right. in the beginning people might have thought oh I'm coming to hear a bluegrass band it's a banjo and then they figured out it wasn't a bluegrass band pretty quick and they either went oh that's cool or they left and luckily there's enough people that like what we do that right. we don't have to be upset or protective you know what I mean I mean, it's like I think the people that some of the traditionalists get very upset um, because not only um, are other people not playing the music traditional, but they have the, a bigger audience a mm -hmm. lot of times. So, I mean, if you're suffering for market share or just to survive for your group right. and your music to survive, it, you, you can get very emotional about these kinds of things. But since we've had good fortune, since the band started, in terms of we've been able to make a living, we've been mm -hmm. able to travel in a bus, we've been able to play for people, get our music out there, we're in a position to be very understanding of all of the people that won't play us or right. won't, you know, uh, that, that, you know, there's enough work to go around. Yeah, in, in other words, there's been enough yeah. for us. So, so enough people do like us that there, it's not necessary for us to have a bad attitude about right. the ones that don't. Right. Well, that's but great. I understand why some of the, the, the staunch jazz and bluegrass traditionalists have an attitude because they're struggling. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it's it's not easy out there. So. But you don't feel like you're compromising any form by taking it to the places that you're doing, right? You're, well, it's a very curious thing because on one end you could say we're a very commercialized version mm -hmm. of something and on the other end you could say we're a very cutting edge mm -hmm. band that, that does things that are that are not commercialized at all it just depends where you're sitting right and either way you're bringing you're probably opening the eyes of the world to this particular you know traditional american music that otherwise people wouldn't know about yeah, young, it ends younger up that way right? a lot because uh, i'm sorry to interrupt but it ends up that way a lot because we'll be in a bluegrass uh, arena and we'll be playing, and people who've never really paid any attention to jazz are suddenly going, mm -hmm. wow, you know, jazz is, there's a little, we're their jazz band. <laughs> and then we'll play in a jazz arena, and, uh, and they never hear bluegrass whatsoever. Right. And, and for them, it's like, wow, the Flectones are like this bluegrass band, this, this jazz bluegrass band. So in, in a lot of ways, I think we make it, uh, you know, we, we draw, blur the lines in a positive mm -hmm. way for them to where now people are telling me, you know, I never heard bluegrass before you, and now I go went out and checked out all the guys, and I really am a bluegrass fan now, and I, I understand about all the other good players that are in bluegrass. And the same thing happens in jazz, too. Mm -hmm. People who came out to see me because I was a bluegrass guy and they knew me uh, became Victor Wooten fans and went out to see him and heard all the different people that he was playing mm -hmm. with and, and went, wow, their world just opened up. So um, it's the, I had a record in um, 1980. One, I think it was called Natural Bridge. Right. And I think that was I was a good title for what I do. Right. What I've ended up doing. Wasn't all these that years. record recently re-released on CD? I believe. Yeah. In fact, it was just in my mind because yeah. I just saw the re-release uh, <laughs> yesterday at the. With a very that. young, young photograph of you on the cover. <laughs> yeah, 19 or 20 years old. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, let's talk about the new album uh, title Outbound. Correct. Correct. How how is how is this record different from the last record? Um, well, it's different um, in some very um, obvious ways. In that, um, I try to figure out how to how to how to explain it. But I, I feel like every record should have its own um, rules mm -hmm. in terms of how you'd approach it. Otherwise, they'll all sound the same. When, especially when you've got a band that's been together for a long time. So here we are recording with the same exact four musicians that recorded on the last record, and trying to do something new. So on the last album, the rules of the album, this was called Left of Cool, mm -hmm. was the rules of the album were that we would be the only people to play on the record, but there could be as many of us as we wanted. Oh, I see. So in other words, we overdubbed, which mm -hmm. we had never done in the past, because the rule used to be uh, if you, we couldn't play it live, you didn't hear it on the record. 
So you might hear two banjos, but I was playing them. To, you know, I was right. switching live during the song. You might hear two basses. Victor was playing them. One was on a stand. You might hear a synthesizer and a harmonica. Howard was playing them at the same time. You hear a synth chord that was coming from the electric banjo. It was all really happening. And that was really important to us. That was like a, you know, a macho thing. Right, we right. really did it. You know, you come hear us, you're going to hear it. Um, but we did that for, uh, you know, six albums or something. I don't know how much. There's a solo album in there somewhere. We did it for a bunch of records anyway. Right, right. So now, now it was like, okay, we're going to make the same record again. You know, so how we can make it different? Well, this time, well, let's play. Let's play around in the studio. Let's do anything we want, but let's just all do it. Everybody so, was in agreement at this point. Yeah, everybody was cool. Everybody likes the challenge mm -hmm. of doing it, finding a different way to do it. So it enabled us to flesh out the record. So I might play guitar, banjo, mandolin on any, or several banjos, or or play some synth pads afterwards, mm -hmm. or anything. Anything I wanted to do, Victor could do multiple basses. If we wanted a horn section, it had to come from Jeff. He played all the horns, um, flutes on the same song. Any, anything any of us could play, we would do. And uh, Future Man sang harmonies with, uh, with the saxophone, which wow. was cool. Yeah. And he had never done that before. And so that was kind of the thrust of that record. Then we had two vocal guests, uh, Dave Matthews and Amy Grant. Right. Who sang? So that was kind of the thrust of that record. So now here we are again, a couple of years later, trying to figure out how to make a record that sounds really different from that. And we decided to have only one of each of us this time, just like in the old days, mm -hmm. but have anybody we wanted to come on and play with us. So we would be like the front, the front line, and then bring in a, a bunch of people that we really liked to come and, and play. How did along. the how did you choose who you wanted to come in and be on the album? Well, we kind of made a list of, of some of our favorite mm -hmm. musicians that we thought were like kind of like us, that were kind of different kind of players. There's a guy named Andy Norell who plays the uh, the steel pans. Mm -hmm. He plays jazz. Grew up uh, in Brooklyn, but but spends time in Trinidad. He's a jazz, whatever, um, steel pan player. Mm -hmm. um, there's a guy we know named Paul uh, Hansen who plays the uh, bassoon, like a to Korea on the bassoon. He's, <laughs> uh, he's just an incredible musician on the wow. bassoon. Um, a friend, Edgar Meyer, who's a classical bass virtuoso on an upright bass, but also an incredible, just, a, just these kind of crazy, wonderful musicians that we interact with. And so it ended up being, uh, you know, a lot of people we've always wanted to do things with. We got Adrian Ballou in. Wow. We've always loved Adrian Ballou's playing. Uh, we had a string quartet on about half of it. Just to, whenever, instead of having a synthesizer, or overdubbing one, like I might have done uh, on the last record, we had to uh, we wrote string parts, and that was a lot of fun. Yeah, I bet. And um, what else? We had tablas, and we had an uh, Indian vocalist, a lady Indian vocalist that we happened to be playing in Nashville while we were doing the session, and I called up and asked if she would stay an extra day, and we got her to just wail on some of the stuff, <laughs> which well, was fun. That must be amazing. It really was. So what happens like on stage now, considering the, the, this album and now the last album with all these different complexities that you're adding in the recording, what happens on stage when you're performing these songs? It's not really an issue, because uh, if you think about it, um, not that I would even compare us slightly to the Beatles, imagine that you know, you've got Abbey Road or you've got Eleanor Rigby or whatever songs that you've heard on the radio. Well, if you went to see the Beatles and it was the four guys playing whatever songs they played, you'd be perfectly happy. Sure. You'd be f perfectly happy to hear those same songs with different arrangements. So what it ends up being is we play our show, and a lot of these songs um, we played live before we recorded them. So we knew that they worked as live songs. Right. And, um, you know, we just, we just don't worry about it. And the audience doesn't seem to mind. Right. Of course, they haven't <laughs> heard the recorded versions it. yet. So. Right. Right. But when they do, it will sound different. But it'll sound a little raw, more raw and more aggressive and, and bare bones. Which it, makes the okay. show more exciting for you, yeah. you know, and for the audience as well, because they're not coming to hear the album played over a loudspeaker. Exactly. They're getting a, different, a unique, special show that they can take home with them. That's, that's another thing, a goal for us, is to make every show feel different and, compl and, and, and special, not, not do the same show every night. Yeah. So having, um, and also having just four guys doing everything uh, and making a big sound, it, it, it seems to work. You uh, recently returned from Australia, correct? Playing a few dates over there. How long yeah. were you over there? Uh, we were played four shows. There. Four shows, I, I, and you've been all over the world, obviously playing playing shows. Do, do you find the audiences uh, in different parts of the world different than the audiences here in America? Sometimes, sometimes. How so? Better, worse? Um, 
not better or worse, um, just different, like uh, different customs, especially in places where they haven't heard a lot of concerts. Mm -hmm. Like I remember we played, uh, the two places that come to mind that were different was, uh, one was a place called Banda Aceh in Indonesia. It was a mm. place all off in a distant part of Indonesia, and they hadn't had big bands play. And we came and, <clears throat> and did a concert, and the whole town came out, and, and um, you know, they're having their first kind of concert loud band concert experience wow. and they applauded whenever we would do something like if we would change sections in a song and it would suddenly sound different they would go crazy <laughs> someone would start a bass solo and they'd go oh and they'd go crazy they didn't applaud at the end of things they applauded at the beginning of things <laughs> so consequently when the song ended and we stopped they stopped That's so you'd finish the song like, bum, 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 and be like <laughs> um, crickets in the back. Let me start the next song and they'd be, wow! <laughs> so that was pretty bizarre. That's interesting. That's very interesting to see the different cultural uh, ways that different cultures express themselves when, when seeing somebody perform. It's but fascinating. The other one was Japan where, uh, where they are very reserved during the concert but at the end they really give it up. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, they, their applause was muted during the show, even at the end of songs. Then at the end of the show, they would go to their feet and, and they would go berserk, and you would go, "Is this the same audience we just played? <laughs> Do you think you were dying?" Right. And then, but it's it's probably a level of respect that they so. have toward, towards the musician. I think so. It's just a, it's you just have to get used to it, you know, and then, right. then it's cool. All right, Clarence Gate Mouth Brown was here yesterday talking about how here he has to deal with people talking through the entire show. Yeah. And like in other countries like, like Japan or any of the, the Eastern countries, they're very quiet and they pay attention. Well, we like a respectful noise. Mm -hmm. That's what I like. I li <laughs> What's I, a respectful noise? Uh, a respectful noise is when people are legitimately excited and they're tuned into the music and they're making noise because they're excited, not because they're talking about, you know, they're over there talking to each other about... <laughs> you know, right. their day or whatever, right, exactly. or because they're, they're, so, they're drinking. I mean, I think it's great, it's fine to do whatever you do to go to a concert, but you should still respect the music. Mm -hmm. And the music is, uh, can be a very serious thing and, yeah, um, for the musicians. And, and uh, on some level, it's up to the musicians to demand that respect by, sh they just have to play good enough to make people shut up. Mm -hmm. You know, so in, in a way, if the audience is talking it, maybe it's partly your fault. You didn't, you didn't hook them by the way you pre presented your music. But on another level, um, I think the music deserves, deserves their respect. Does that ever happen to you where you, at, at this stage in the game, in your, this stage in your career where you go out and you're, you don't get the audience? You don't hook them in right away? It's pretty rare right. because they, came to, they usually come to see us. Right. And the people that choose to come see us usually know what we're doing and they know that it's complex and it takes some listening. Mm -hmm. And they want, that's why they came. So it, it's unusual, but we do have a problem nowadays where sometimes we have two different audiences, and one is an, um, an older sit-down audience. They just really want to sit in the nice seats and listen and get swept away by the music, and then the other half of the audience is a young audience that maybe is influenced by my work with Dave Matthews right. or the band's work <clears throat> with them on Fish, and they want to dance. <laughs> and if you're really there to watch the, the music and stuff, and someone's standing in front of you dancing, you're not a happy camper. No. And if you're there to, and you really want to dance and move around, and your 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 commitment to the music is just as great, though you're you're because you, yeah, cause you want to move, it's making you want to move, and you can't move. You're a very frustrated person. So we run into that <laughs> where that where and 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 we've we've asked people to respect each other, you know, and and if you really want to watch the show, be down front, and if you want to dance, please move to the side to understand. You don't have to be standing in front of the band to to be dancing. Do the audiences do they listen to you when you ask for that? Yeah, or if you they... ask it in the right way, mm -hmm. in a, in a, in a understanding enough way, and say, hey, we've got a lot of different kinds of people here together, and we're really glad that you're all here. Right. Let's make this a great experience, and then they, they get it. But we don't usually say anything until it becomes a problem. Right, that's excellent. It's kind of a downer. But yeah, well, <laughs> it's good that you say something at all. I think most bands would be just, you know, too bad and you know, right. deal with it. I'm not out in the audience. I got to concentrate on what I'm doing on stage. But yeah. I mean, that's a, a testament to your, you know, to the dedication you have to the fans. Well, so. we we appreciate the fact that we get to do this. This wasn't. It's not a given. That we would get to do this and get to do it on the level, on right. just the size of audience we're getting to do it to now. It's, so we feel like we owe a, lo a lot to them. Um, last year, you recorded uh, an episode for uh, Austin City Limits with an, an amazing lineup of musicians with uh, Earl Scruggs, Vassar Clemens, Sam Bush, Jerry Douglas, right? That's correct. How much, uh, how much 
well, first of all, how did this particular lineup come together? How did this? How did you guys get together to do this show? This was an album I did. Um, it was my last uh, album for Warner Brothers. Mm -hmm. It's called the Bluegrass Sessions. Mm -hmm. It was the first bluegrass type project I had done since uh, 1998, I think. 1988. So it had been a long time, and a lot of these guys and myself had made a record around that time called Drive. That was a bluegrass. Um, instrumental record and mm. over the years it's kind of become a, a cult classic to, to people that know all these musicians and a, a special moment for all of us and I wanted to play with those guys again because over the last 10 years I've been playing with the Flectones almost all, all right. the time and it's not that I don't love these other guys and um, don't think that I mean I think they're just as stunning musicians they just bluegrass musicians right. so I thought it was about time that I started making uh, a regular uh, a regular attempt to play bluegrass with these guys and try and set it up as an ongoing thing that could be happening. Mm -hmm. So that when I made that record, I was thinking, okay, how can I get this core group together, Sam Bush, Tony Rice, Jerry Douglas, Stuart Duncan, Mark Schatz, and myself, and play, play this, you know, play, and play. And so the record, and then Earl Scruggs agreed to do it, mm -hmm. and John Hartford and uh, and Vassar Clements and other people. So it became a little bit more. And then we toured the record, right. and during that tour, we were able to score a Austin City Limits taping. And how much preparation goes into a, a tour like this with with a new set of musicians? Is it a lot of time. The tour, uh, <clears throat> there was no preparation for, um, but the re recording, um, we, uh, I got together with each musician individually and made sure they understood the songs, and then we recorded them. The same basic process that. Right. Uh, that we did on the Flectones, which was just to record a bunch of takes, right. and uh, nobody overdubbed or fixed anything. We just, just, uh, I just used the best parts of what what had actually happened with the musicians. And then um, the first show, we did we didn't do as many um, new songs, mm -hmm. and we did a lot of standards. And by halfway through the tour, we had most of the record on stage. Right. Um, what what do you think of the notion that musicians have to suffer for their art? Um, in terms of like you don't have a fine wine until it's aged or, or what? Um, I think well I've just I've I've in while while doing this job I've heard a lot of people say that, they, that you can't write good music unless you're suffer you know you're, that you suffer through certain life things certain elements of your life become difficult and makes you want to write you think that's true that you have to suffer through life to, to, to be creative? I think you have to have something to say mm -hmm. I think music is about communication. So if you, if you're, you know, if you're born with uh, um, things to say, you know, you, sh you can go ahead and say them. And if they speak to people, then people will think it's good, you know. Right. But um, I don't know. Uh, that's a good. That's a good question. It seems like some kind of life experience helps you to write better right. songs because you got something to talk about. I always think about like if I just was going to be a writer. Um, I wouldn't be very, I don't think I would be very good, but whenever I have something to say, like if I was to write an article about the banjo, right. it would be like a, a text, it would be perfect because I just know my subject. Right. So if you're talking about life stuff in a song, it would be the same thing. If you've got legitimate feelings you had or, fe or something you went through and you write about it in a song and it's for real, it's going to come off like it's going right. to be good. So I, I think it doesn't have to be you know, agony. It could right. be. I mean, it could be. I mean, just being a teenager is hard. <laughs> right. And so a lot of the a lot of the the rock bands that are singing about that, you know, they're reaching out to an audience that is going through that experience right. of, of growing up, it, and yeah. it's hard. And so, so that makes sense to them. You know, so I I think everybody suffers in life, no matter what. But it, it does make you. If you didn't suffer, you wouldn't know what it's like not to suffer. Good you know, point. it's part of it, everything. It's a yin and yang. You do. Right. Very so true. I don't know. So what's uh, what's next for uh, for the band after, after Jazz Fest? What are, you, what are you guys doing next? Well, let's see. We're gonna take about a month off. Mm -hmm. We're not working too too intently because the record comes out in the end of, of July. We're gonna be in Europe all through July. Mm -hmm. We're gonna be doing uh, Telluride Jazz Fest, uh, Bluegrass Festival, and uh, Playboy Jazz Festival um, uh, in June. About um, maybe about 15 shows in June. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to be going on tour this next month of May, which will be this will already be mm -hmm. have happened <laughs> um, with a, a tabla player, and I'm working hard on, on learning a lot about Indian music right now because oh, I'm wow. trying to go to India in January to perform, and I, I'm going to be uh, trying to play some Indian music. So that's a huge job learning that stuff. So I'm doing about five shows with the, this great tabla player, and we're going to 
it'd be kind of a workshop in small clubs just to just to play the music Very and cool. see what that's like. Well, that's a lot of stuff for us to look forward to. The album tour in the in the fall, I guess, and, and the solo show. That's excellent. Yeah, a lot of stuff. A lot of other stuff too. Cool.